Hey, you guys, welcome back to Let's Be Real. Joe just said that I am fangirling more than he's ever seen me over our guest today. And it's probably true. Nicole and Lewis is an incredible writer. She's an amazing activist. Her story is really, really incredible. I mean, I already used that word, but that's the right word to describe it. Uh, Nicole is a graduate of the College of William & Mary, as am I, but she went to William & Mary with a three-month-old baby in tow and has devoted her life to really empowering a generation of young parents to be able to finish their education while also taking care of their children. She has a master's degree in social policy and communications from George Mason, and she is the founder of Generation Hope, which is an incredible organization that really does this work of empowering students to succeed um, in college. So you guys are going to love this conversation that I'll have with Nicole. And if you want to check out her organization or her memoir, Pregnant Girl, a story of teen motherhood, college, and creating a better future for young families, you guys, I cannot put this book down. It is so good. So if you want to be inspired for how you can be a part of this solution, check out her book, check out Generation Hope. You're going to love it. And without further ado, here's our conversation. Now, Nicole, do you know what our name means? I feel like we should start here. Oh, no. Let's talk oh, about okay. it. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm so glad to tell you. Um, so Nicole means victory over the people, which mm. is an apt title for someone like you who is running an organization <laughs> and has <laughs> put out a beautiful work, um, Pregnant Girl. This book is so good. I just was raving about it right before we got on the podcast because the way that you weave together your personal story mm. and then engage us in education about such important issues of our day, it's so good. So mm. congratulations. I know that a work, you know, a book is a real labor of love. So um, thank you for putting out your story in such a vulnerable way for so many. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And thanks for being my my unofficial PR person. <laughs> <laughs> always happy. Always happy to support a fellow Nicole. So we have a, we have a couple of things in common, our name, and we also share, um, we are alumni of the College of William & Mary. We yes. both were there, not at the same time, but we both went to school. But I think that we had pretty different experiences. Mm -hmm. And that's what a lot of your book is about. I'd love for you just as a way by way of introduction, maybe to tell us kind of where you are today and what your everyday life looks like. And then also maybe take us back to that moment when you arrived on the campus of William & Mary as a freshman. Yeah. So today I am um, first and foremost, a mom of five. Um, yes. So days are extremely busy and um, a lot of variety <laughs> and a lot of unanswered. <laughs> you're, you're definitely like having, hopefully having victory over the little people. Yes, every I don't day. know. I feel like they have victory <laughs> over me most days by the time my head hits the pillow. Um, but I'm a mom of five. I'm a wife and I'm also the founder and CEO of a nonprofit organization called Generation Hope. And um, and so I wear a lot of hats in, yeah. in that role as well and just kind of keeping all the balls in the air. But similarly, um, get to do it with some amazing people and every mm. day is different. And um, it's, it's been an honor and a privilege to to found this organization and to, to grow it. Um, and my journey started um, back in 1999. I started mm. at, at the College of William Mary, our alma mater. Um, when, uh, my daughter was a little under three months old. So mm. I was not your typical freshman starting at William and Mary. And, um, the feeling that I had was just felt completely out of place and, mm. um, felt like my feet didn't belong on that campus mm. and was very aware as I looked around at the other students that I was different, you know, in many mm -hmm. ways being, being a black student, but also, um, certainly being a mother and, and an mm -hmm. undergraduate student, all of that was not lost on me. Um, and I would have never pictured myself in the seat that I sit in today, um, you know, as mm. a CEO and, and as an mm. author. So very different beginning. <laughs> wow. Wow. I, yeah, I think about, um, you know, and a lot of, a lot of your memoir gives a lot of lead up to that moment, you know, when you got there. And I think about the obstacles that we're gonna talk about in just a moment that you faced, that many single parents face, teenage parents face. And I'm wondering how you went from a place where you thought, 
I don't, my feet don't even belong here. I'm so different. What was the mindset that kept propelling you forward through, you know, a very difficult, diff I mean, you just had to work so hard to, you know, work harder really than students who were in your same classes. When, when did that mindset, what did that mindset look like? And do you remember a moment where you thought like, I've done it, like mm. I'm doing it? So I think for me, it was survival mode. And, and one mm. of the ways I describe it is there was no plan B. You know, okay. it wasn't like if I wasn't successful at William and Mary, I had a, a fallback plan. You know, mm -hmm. I could go work for my dad's business or, you know, what have you. There was not another option if mm -hmm. college didn't work. And, um, you know, I had a mouth to feed. I had a little mm -hmm. one who was looking to me every day to figure it out and to, mm -hmm. to, to make sure that I was moving us forward. And so my motivation was really my daughter is just mm. wanting her to have the life that I felt that she deserved the life that, mm. you know, all children deserve. And I knew that college was, was really my best way to get there. So that, mm -hmm. that was, um, the big thing propelling me. And I think, you know, um, I often tell our students this and, and, and I didn't tell myself this enough, which was, I, I really always looked at the degree as, the validation and the thing that was going mm. to, you know, prove that I was uh, worthy or prove that I had accomplished something. And in reality, I was accomplishing something every day, like every day mm -hmm. waking up, you know, as a young mother in college, keeping her fed, keeping a mm. roof over her head, you know, so I didn't take the time, I think, to celebrate myself as much as I should mm. have. And I see that with our students. So many of them see the degree as the thing you know, that's going to validate them or yeah. show that they have achieved something. And in reality, I want them to see themselves as having achieved so much every day and who they are right now. So I, I'm, and it's funny because, um, I couldn't even really appreciate my graduation because mm. I had the degree in hand, but I remember sitting in the commencement ceremony in William and Mary hall. And all I could think about was like, okay, now I need a job. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like interesting because the thing that I was working so hard towards was finally here. And then I wasn't able to really appreciate it and celebrate it because then I was on to the next thing. And so, mm. you know, I, I've now much more as I've grown and learned over the years to celebrate the here and now and the big mm. things and the small things and all the things in between. But mm. definitely I, I didn't do a great job of just stopping and taking stock, you know, mm. at that point in my life. Uh, I just, I feel so, I mean, so much resonance. I was telling you before we got on this podcast, you know, that Dave and I, my husband have had the the privilege and honor of being really close um, to a dear friend named Olivia, who was raising her daughter also pregnant as a freshman in college and I, everything you're saying, I'm like, yeah, that's the feeling. It's almost like Olivia is eight years out, you know, uh, Mila's eight years old. And it's almost just now that she's catching up to the fact mm. that like, she did it. Like, yeah. it was a huge deal. And I remember that exact same thing where she was like, I have to get a job. The The purpose though, you know, I almost... I, I always stood in awe of the amount of like resilience and strength mm. and purpose, you know, that you could go from a 17 year old an 18 year old to a mother who is like very, very serious about, about life, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, um, that to me is almost the, the redemptive blessing, right. Mm. Of like a situation that no one ever wants to find themselves in necessarily. But I, you know, that I really believe that God can use, um, Olivia had a lot of support. And one of the things that was really noticeable to me that I've spoken about, you know, a lot in my work is that even with that amount of a support, it was so hard. And yeah. so your, your, your level of support and your own sort of, you talk about this intersectionality that a lot of times we look at issues like teen pregnancy, like education, like race, and we don't think of them as connected. Mm -hmm. And you do a great job of weaving that together. I wonder if you could, could kind of mention a couple of those things that you see in your work that you experienced in your story to shed light on like what the real obstacles are when you're, you know, you know, facing sort of trying to be empowered to move forward in your life. Yeah. So, um, you know, when we look at the teen parent population and even the larger parenting college student population, they're more likely to be students of color. Um, mm. you know, and when we look at teen pregnancy, um, young, uh, black 
um, girls are twice more likely to become pregnant than their white mm. counterparts, um, you know, and as well as Latinx um, young folks. So, um, and, and indigenous folks have the highest rates of teen pregnancy. Mm-hmm. So that is not coincidence. You know, when we think mm-hmm. about how those communities have been oppressed and marginalized and how really they've been cut off from resources and opportunities mm-hmm. historically in this country, all of that is connected. Um, and one of the things that I talk about, you know, the biggest one of the biggest myths, there are so many myths about teen pregnancy, mm-hmm. but one of the biggest myths is that teen pregnancy causes poverty. And in reality, Mm -hmm. poverty causes teen pregnancy. And Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, we talk about sex education and birth control and all of these things are really important when it comes to teen pregnancy prevention. But we're not talking enough about poverty and alleviating Mm -hmm. poverty as being really a key factor in teen pregnancy prevention. Mm. Um, And so when I look at my own situation, you know, coming into a predominantly white institution like William & Mary, one of the earliest colleges in this country. So we think about how, um, you know, William & Mary and and other colonial colleges really baked in the DNA for the higher ed system we know today. That higher ed system was was not designed for me as a young Black mother. It was not Mm -hmm. designed for many marginalized populations. It, It really... Um, focused on white men with resources. And so Mm -hmm. as I came into that environment, I'm coming in at a disadvantage. I'm coming in really having to navigate a system that was not designed for me to succeed. And that's Mm. in various ways for me as my identity as a mother, my identity as a Black student, a student student of color, a student with low income, um, Mm. you know, not being able to afford books, um, not having to make decisions between heat and uh, keeping the heat on and buying groceries for the week, mm-hmm. um, having to a, a find affordable childcare, which is was impossible then, and is is even more difficult now. You know, twenty years later, with how mm-hmm. much childcare has skyrocketed. Um, going to a college where very few people look like me, not only in the classrooms, but also in terms of my professors, in terms of mm-hmm. the administrators. Um, there were more people who looked like me working behind the counter at the cafeteria and in the facilities. And so all of those things coming together, and, and we haven't even gotten into how difficult it is for parenting students to find supports across higher ed. Simple things yeah. like lactation rooms, um, mm-hmm. but also, you know, big things like, again, you know, we know the costs of going to school are higher for parenting students. So financially, you know, having the resources just to get to school and to get through school. So the intersection of all of those identities create a situation where there are so many significant barriers to completion. Yeah. And I, and I just want to say for anyone who's listening right now, you get into like, if you're listening and, and you wish you could ask Nicole questions like, well, what about this? And what about that? And why poverty? And the nuance of what you bring to this book is the answer that you need. So oh, whatever awesome. question you have right now, <laughs> um, you're, I really do. Because I remember, you know, I felt like a great book makes you feel like you're having a conversation with the author. And so as you were, you know, at one point, I remember you said, you know, we need to be asking the question, why? Like, why are we, why is this a situation? Instead mm. of just trying to solve the problem with whatever, sex ed, birth control, whatever, why is it the way that it is? And yeah. you you pull a lot of those threads in the memoir from, you know, the the historic oppression of black men and what that creates to what does birth control really look like when you're in a situation with poverty, all of those things um, you talk about. So Thank get the you. book. That's the end of my um, pub- that's, that's the end of my public service announcement because it's just. I mean, I, I just don't want to miss in this very short episode that this is a very nuanced, complex conversation. And so, whatever's rising up in you right now, if this hasn't been your situation, if you are not uh, a person of color, if you think about well, just pull your whatever is going through your mind right now. I want to really urge you to enter in to the fullness of the complexity of the problem, because that's the only way that we're actually going to make progress moving forward, which takes us to kind of, Nicole, to your work. Um, I'd love to hear more about Generation Hope, where you kind of enter in, and particularly this whole idea of a two-generation model, because what a beautiful expression of like redemptive purpose in your life, the work that you do now. So can you tell us a little bit about the genesis of the organization and then this two-generation model concept? Well, I graduated um, from college and, you know, felt this 
just, of course, really excited about what was happening with, you know, earning my degree and what I would be able to do for both my daughter and I. But I also graduated with a tremendous sense of wanting to give back. It was so hard, Mm. you know, for me to get through college and it didn't have to be. And I think my experience really exposed me to um, just how systems are working against, um, you know, young parents and and more broadly um, people living in in poverty. And so um, I, I always kind of felt this tugging at my heart that, you know, I wanted to start an organization and kind of figuring out what that would be. My first job out of college, I was doing PR for um, a major insurance company and, and really loved my comms work, but also did not like insurance. <laughs> so um, <laughs> was like, I got to get out of here. And and I really loved um, nonprofits and knew mm. that I that was kind of where my heart was. And so I started um, working for nonprofits, all youth serving nonprofits, and okay. fell in love with with the nonprofit sector. And um, I was doing some consulting work for a nonprofit. And it was about the time that the economy it was in, you know, 2009, 10, things were still in the dumps in terms of the economy and unemployment and housing and all of that. Um, and so my contract went south with the economy and mm. and my husband and I were having this come to Jesus conversation. And what do you feel like God is calling you to do? Mm-hmm. And I said, help you pay these bills. And he was like, no, <laughs> really? And I prayed and went to bed that night and wrote the business plan for Generation Hope. And it just wow. organically like just flowed through me. Um, and never stopped from that next morning on in terms of, you know, making this organization a reality and then growing it. And what what our guiding star is, is how do we help more young parents um, earn their college degrees? And mm. um, we have created a uh, our core programming, which is our scholar program. And that is a holistic model. It's very much about the entire student, the whole student not just saying we're here to help you academically, but you have to figure mm-hmm. out everything else on your own. So we have emotional and financial supports that really ra- we wrap around the student. So mm-hmm. for example, for financial supports, we provide tuition assistance. We also have an emergency fund in any crisis mm-hmm. situation that comes up. We get that funding to them in 72 hours. That could be a domestic violence situation. It could be, mm-hmm. um, you know, I'm getting evicted from my apartment. I can't afford childcare this month. Um, We also collect tangible items from the community, anything from a laptop to diapers, you know, anything Mm. that's going to help that family. And then emotional support, which was equally important. We have a really robust mentoring program where caring individuals in the community um, really walk alongside our scholars and their college journey and our cheerleaders. That's the biggest Mm. role that they play. You know, it's very isolating to be a parenting student, especially a teen parent, when you've been ostracized and judged and pushed to the fringes Mm -hmm. to have someone who's there, who's not there to judge, who's really there to celebrate you and to say, how can we get through some of the difficulties that maybe you're, you're experiencing right now um, is a big, big support to, to our Mm -hmm. scholars. Um, And then uh, we also have just an amazing program team. We call them hope coaches and they help with anything from, Hey, I need help proofreading this English paper too. Can you come with me and help me figure out how to renew my DACA status and Mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Um, And we launched our early childhood program, Next Generation Academy, probably um, three or four years ago. Um, And the, um, the whole idea with that is just, as you said, is like we often are, are really trying to solve these issues that are that are family issues in silos. So if a yeah. child is coming to school hungry, um, we often say, well, let's make sure they get on free and reduced lunch. But we never ask, like, what's going on at home? Is right. mom or dad unemployed? Is mom or dad not in the picture anymore? What is going on where there, we might be able to help with the larger family issue? Because we know that when parents and children are supported together, they're more likely to be successful. So how can Mm -hmm. we not only address the fact that the child's coming to school hungry, but maybe we are able to provide some employment assistance or Mm -hmm. education assistance to make sure that that parent gets into a good paying job. So um, what we do is we provide that early childhood education support Mm -hmm. at that critical time, right before they're getting into uh, elementary school and an early Mm -hmm. elementary school and simultaneously helping their parent get a college degree. And Mm -hmm. so it's been game changing to just be able to see families thrive together. 
Oh my gosh. I just, I, I'm like, not, I can't stop nodding. Cause I'm like, yes, it, of course. Like <laughs> yeah. it's just addressing the whole person. I have a friend who says the greatest poverty is a poverty of connections. Mm. And just what I've seen in my work, I work um, also here in Richmond with youth and um, I'm on a board there. And when you see the lack of, first of all, like a vision for your life, representation for yourself, and then navigating the system. Yeah. It, to even, you know, to even get, like you you mentioned, you know, housing at Women Mary and all of these forms and these, all of this financial aid. I mean, sometimes even just helping my own children, I'm like, holy moly, this is so complex. It is. So to imagine being a person who's trying to survive with a child, any of us who've raised children know you, you never feel like you can have enough support. It's it's, right. it's so all consuming to then um, have this holistic model to wrap around that starts addressing those issues. Um, tell me one of your favorite stories from Generation Hope. Oh, oh gosh, this is always <laughs> the hardest question because there's so many great stories. <laughs> I'll give you one that's really recent. We um, had a scholar come into our program. Um, oh gosh, she's probably been, she probably came to us maybe seven years ago. Um, and, uh, just extremely shy, um, uh, you know, a mother, she had a, a little girl, maybe who was about two or three at the time. Um, she was uh, attending school in DC, going to Trinity Washington university, um, and just really came to us very shy, very, um, guarded. Um, that's mm. one of the things that I often talk to our mentors about is this population in particular is, is often really guarded. There are walls mm -hmm. that they've had to put up in their lives because yeah. people have been so judgmental, sometimes before the pregnancy more often, uh, but then definitely that is kind of fortified by a pregnancy young. Um, and so she definitely came in just in a shell, if you will. Mm. And, you know, one of the things that we do is we work really hard to build trust. We want to be a space where our students feel like we're, um, they're celebrated, they're supported, they're accepted for who they are. And so we work really hard. Those are our values and we infuse our values in our work. And so, you know, we chiseled away at the wall over the years and it was so amazing to see her coming out of her shell. Um, she graduated from Trinity Washington with her accounting degree and we just hosted a career week, um, actually last week, where we have expanded our programming to now be not only about getting them through college, but getting them into that job, right? We want them to mm. get into that job with those family sustaining wages. So we have a whole career readiness programming uh, program, and a part of that programming is a career week. And um, she came and she spoke on, on a panel of alums wow. um, that I was able to moderate and just, it was so amazing to see her giving advice to our current scholars, mm. talking about um, the challenges of being a young parent that she experienced going into the workforce. Um, you know, things like going into an organization where you don't, again, you're, you're, you don't see people who look like you, you don't see people yeah. with the same lived experiences, mm -hmm. but then also the um, strengths and the skills mm -hmm. that she brought to her position as a young mom, the resilience that you talked about, mm -hmm. the determination, the mm -hmm. assets that she was able to bring into her company because of her experience. And it was just such a like proud mama moment to yeah. see her <laughs> like, oh my gosh, she's on this panel. And I told her afterwards, um, you know, I'm like, you did so such an amazing job. You know, you, mm. you would never have thought that that she would have ever been afraid to speak on a panel. She was yeah. so confident. And I think just seeing her evolution, you know, to see yeah. how she came into the program and then to see her thriving, being able to, she talked about buying her first house and, mm. you know, all of the economic benefits that come from college, but the, then also those those other benefits that are not monetary, it's just the self-discovery, right? And, yeah. and, and you know, being coming into your own, I was just so, so proud of her. So that's a very recent one where, I, again, I had a very proud mama moment watching her oh on the panel. Oh my gosh, I just, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I you know, it just strikes me, and you mentioned this in your book, that the intersectionality, like, um, it's not true for everyone, but oftentimes to get to the place where, you know, a teen pregnancy happens, there is a, a void, right? There's a void of love. There's a void of support. There's something, um, there may be generational trauma. So when you think about the idea of supporting young moms who then are breaking those generational bonds with their own children right away in like an early intervention way, it's so powerful. And for, yes. you know, people who are listening who 
care about like productivity, you know, like care about like your return on an investment, the return on investment in being a part of engaging in this work, whether that's because you give or you get involved as a volunteer or whatever, there, there's a huge return on the investment that goes beyond just like, oh, great, we got, you know, this parent got through college because they're impacting their child, you know, yes. in a way that's going to be life changing. Um, I just am curious when people, how do people get to the program and what are you kind of excited about that's coming next? Yeah. So, um, and I'm assuming you mean scholars or mentors? Yeah. Or? Like how do your scholars get to you? Like how do yeah. they find you? Like, so our scholars find us in a myriad of ways. Um, we have, uh, relationships with all of the different colleges in the DC region. So mm -hmm. we do a lot to cultivate those relationships, making sure their financial aid offices, their scholarship offices and different offices know about our program and spread the word to their students. We also have partnerships with like DC public schools and, mm -hmm. um, and uh, Fairfax County Public Schools, where we can also start talking to any students who are in high school who are expecting or, or parenting about the fact that college is a viable option for them um, and, and giving them some information about our program. We've reached pre-pandemic, maybe two to 300 um, pregnant and expecting um, and parenting students through those uh, college readiness workshops that we've done. Yeah both at schools and then anywhere where we can find young parents. So homeless uh, shelters or mm. um, other, you know, organizations or social service agencies. Um, word of mouth has been a big um, mm -hmm. driver for us because we're now serving 142 teen moms and dads across the DC region. Wow. So yeah, they'll tell their friends and say, I'm in this program, which is always really effective. Um, and then we do a lot. We do a big push on social media. We're, we're mm -hmm. dipping our toe in TikTok. We're... <laughs> <laughs> uh, against my will, uh, we're dipping our toe in TikTok. But, but that's where the youths yes, are. That's, that's where, where the, the youths, youths are. are. That's where they are. So we go to where they are. Um, so yeah, we're, we, we have a myriad of ways. I think, um, you know, we're uh, approaching the midpoint of our 2024 strategic plan, which calls for okay. ambitious growth across the organization. Um, we are going to be growing the number of uh, families that we're serving in D.C. So we'll be at 175 um, teen parents uh, across the D.C. region that we're supporting um, come this summer. And then we're growing to our first community outside of the D.C. region. Um, yeah, this summer as well. And we've been really thoughtful in that process since I started the organization in 2010. It's been a big question. Okay. When are you coming to my community? Yeah. So we're, we're excited to finally be able to um, expand and become a, a multi-site organization in that way. Um, and then we're, we have new work that's um, not just supporting the families directly, but systemic change work. So um, mm. we're now working with policy makers on how do we champion policies that really uh, create economic mobility for young families mm. and for parenting students um, at the federal and local level. We're working with colleges and universities across the country to help them create campuses and that are more supportive of parenting mm -hmm. students. So for example, we were just in Richmond last week, actually, and um, we had convened seven institutions in Richmond from across the country, and we made a trip to um, uh, the Fairfield Area Library yeah, um, yeah. and took a look at their their family friendly PlayStations yes, and how they have the yes. computers with the cribs and the, the play yes. areas attached to them. So we're we're helping colleges really um, learn more about how to support this population, but yeah. also building their capacity to do so. Um, and then we release research and reports. So um, we just released a report last month called Hire Together that surveyed all of our alums over our 12 year history to, to show mm. what the impact of a college degree had done in their lives. So um, where are they in terms of how much money they're making, their careers wow. that they're in, all of that. And it's pretty amazing. We Woo, saw you that gave me they're the yeah. Give me the chills. Yeah. Because I know, I bet it was. More than doubled, right? When you're oh thinking my gosh. about um, wow. the impact. So yeah, so there's a lot of moving parts, uh, but a lot of exciting stuff that's happening. Oh my gosh. Are you, can you say where the location is or is I can't. It's so funny. It's like, now that I do these interviews, everybody's like, where? Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm like, blink twice. If it's Richmond, blink <laughs> twice. If it's Richmond. <laughs> that would be amazing. Cause it's a very quick trip for me. If, 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 I know. if we were in Richmond, but yeah, I think that was a blink once. I don't think it's Richmond. <laughs> <laughs> we are announcing, um, we'll do a soft announcement in December. So, and then okay. we'll do a bigger splash in January. So, um, it's coming. The news will be out soon. 
I kind of like it because now everyone listening is like, I don't, I don't even know how much I care, but I have to now get connected <laughs> for anyone be, who's on the fence. Hopefully most you. of you care a lot, but, um, <laughs> but also actually I should say for a minute, I don't even mean, I'm not trying to throw shade. I just, I think we all need to really listen to that mm. place where like our passion and purpose align. And if you're listening to this conversation and it brings you alive because you get it, then engage, you know, just yeah. take the next step. And if it's not this and it's, if it's something else that really, really gets you going, then just engage in, in that. I mean, yes. we need all of us connected. So how can we help? Like, how can we get involved with Generation Hope? Yeah. So um, we have lots of volunteer opportunities, whether you're in the DC region or you're outside of the DC region. So okay. um, virtual and in person. In person are things like the mentoring. Um, we have individual mentoring opportunities, but also group mentoring opportunities. If it was mm -hmm. you and your neighbors wanted to get together and group mentor one of our families, you could do that. Um, but we also have virtual things like tutoring. If, you're, if mm. you feel passionate about a certain subject and you're, you know, you, you, um, are an expert in a certain subject and we have a student who's struggling with a class that's related to that. We have virtual tutoring options. That's awesome. Um, and even in our career readiness, we have some virtual like mock interviewing and things like that. So if you go to our mm -hmm. website at generationhope.org, you'll see all of that. Um, I would say too, if you are um, a an institution and you're interested in growing your student parent work, we mm -hmm. do a lot of work with institutions all over the country to do that. Um, every dollar counts. So donations of any amount make a big difference for our families. It allows us to really help them on their college journeys and mm -hmm. help their little ones in their elementary school success. Um, but yeah, and we're on social, so we're pretty active. If you go to support Gen Hope awesome. on Instagram and Twitter, um, and then I'm active on um, both of those, just Nicole and Lewis. Awesome, you guys. We'll put all of that in the show notes too, so you guys can make those connections. But the book is Pregnant Girl, a story of teen motherhood, college, and creating a better future for young families. This is a great next step if you want to engage in this topic. And Nicole, this has been lovely. I have one final question. It's very light just sort of like our lift out of here. What is like changing your life right now? Like an app, a product, a show, mm. just like what's that thing that gives you that little bit of bump when you need it? I just finished, I'm late to the game here, but I just finished Stranger Things on Netflix. Okay, all of them? That, like you saw all the seasons? I did. Nice. I like binge watched <laughs> it over the course of like, I don't know, several weeks. But um, it was really good. It, you know, yeah. I was very, I resisted for a long time. And now I'm like, when is the next season coming yeah. out? <laughs> You're like, I'm with it now. I get it. I know. I know. Now I was... I'm like looking up all the fan stuff. I'm like, oh gosh, I have to like chill out. But yes. Oh my gosh. That's so funny. I know. I, I'm sure you know this, but I think it, what might've been one of the guys in the room right now who told me that Stranger Things, their inspiration was to bring E.T., Goonies and Poltergeist together. Oh, and as I soon as you like know that. that you're like, that's what it is. It's like those it. things brought together. So anyway, yes, yeah, I love Stranger Things. I think that's a really great fun. point. Yes. <laughs> oh, man. Well, Nicole, thank you for giving us your time and thank just you. your heart today. And we're excited about Generation Hope. And the future is so bright. And you bring so much life and love to the world and the work that you do. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, Nicole. It's been great. Absolutely. But I don't feel so lost with you. Flying through the mountain ranges, but I never see the danger. That final boss is swinging.